This week on The Aviators, more than 75 years old and getting a new lease on life. We're looking at how Basler Turbo Conversions is turning the DC-3 into a whole new airplane. Thought about being a pilot? Or maybe you want to be an air traffic controller. We look at how university can help you find a career in aviation. Earlier this year, airline pilot Jeff Lewis looked at the Boeing 787 Dreamliner, the manufacturer's latest in their long line of commercial jets. While the company has orders for more than 850 of these aircraft, Boeing is also projecting that there may not be enough commercial pilots to fly them. According to their estimates, the airlines will need more than 460,000 new pilots over the next 20 years. Of course, this is going to place not only a demand on new pilots, but also a whole range of supporting careers such as airline management and air traffic control. While there's lots of different paths to a career in aviation, one of the most well-rounded would be a college education in aerospace. Well, depending on the type of career, because obviously there are many careers uh, in aviation. Adam Geisler is a flight instructor with the John D. Odegaard School of Aerospace at the University of North Dakota. If you're looking for that airline job and you want to start getting ready for, you know, the airline life early, uh, a college program is going to have you, you know, uh, in an airplane doing uh, checklist procedures like they're going to do in the airlines. They're going to have you reading policies, procedures like they do in the airlines. Uh, you're going to be kind of in the same environment that you would be in the, in the airline environment, and you're going to be preparing for that early. So from day one, it's you're getting prepared for that, that airline job. An aerospace degree program will combine a traditional university degree with flight training and aerospace specific studies. Certainly you want the technical skills to be able to fly the airplane. Bruce Smith is the Dean of the Odegaard School of Aerospace Sciences. But most of the time you're not in the airplane. You're with crews in varying environments. You're in the office, you're in flight ops, you're in different places where you interact with people all the time and those other skills become as important as your flying skills. So one of our standards is to have a well-rounded pilot that's educated broadly in the liberal arts. As a result of this combined education, a student coming out of UND Aerospace may not have just a degree, but also a pilot's license or licenses. Well, it depends on the degree. There are a couple different degree options. I guess the first one you could look at is the management ones. If you want to do more of a business, uh, you could have just a private pilot license, or uh, if you do the aviation management program, you would have a commercial multi-engine pilot license. If you did a commercial aviation, you would also have the commercial multi-engine pilot license with instruments and uh, you'd also come through with your instructor ratings as well. To enable them to teach the next generation of pilots, UND has an impressive fleet with more than 120 aircraft. Well from here, you know, we're starting out in the Cessna 172, single engine, you know, you're just getting your fundamentals down. We work through that all the way up through your commercial and then we transition into the Seminole, um, our multi-engine trainer here. And with that, uh, we're you know, starting to work with a uh, faster airplane, more complex. Uh, we're working in the instrument environment more so with it. And we also start to introduce the crew resource management with that as well. So we're doing CRM in our, in our multi-training to, to get an applicant ready for that, that phase. And then from there, through the commercial aviation program, we have the CRJ trainer as well. So um, students can opt in for CRJ training, which is a, a unique experience. For careers that actually involve flying, commercial pilot is the first thing that comes to mind. But that's far from being the only type of flying that students come to UND to learn. Some students want to become anything from crop dusters to airshow pilots to float plane pilots. Uh, we have a, a wide variety. So corporate pilots, uh, you know, some just want to become instructors and, and, and want to instruct. You know, it's a good career in itself. As Bruce and Adam have mentioned earlier, 
Flying and pilot training are just one part of what UND does. When I came here 12 and a half years ago, our focus was left seat, big airplane, big airline. And that was not my career. My career was in aerospace, but it was an entirely different track than the major airlines. And so when I came here, we started to diversify into all the other jobs that are a part of aerospace, certainly with the emphasis on commercial aviation and flying with the airlines, which is still our largest major, but diversifying into all the other opportunities. We have four departments beside aviation, which include atmospheric science, space studies, computer science, and earth system science and policy. Each of those have master's degrees and along with their undergraduate programs and each has a doctoral program. So we have had graduates now in the doctoral programs that go off into other things related to aerospace and more focused on research as much as the actual operation world. A lot of people come here because they want to be airline pilots, but then they find out there's a lot of other aspects, air traffic control, uh, management, education, uh, mechanics. There's a lot of different areas you can go into. And uh, the, the, also the nice thing is we also have business degrees. So a lot of people get a business degree. They may not want to be a pilot for the company, but they may want to get into corporate management. Air traffic control is one of the fields that UND has put a lot of their effort into improving their training facilities. They now have a 360 degree tower simulator where students can experience being a controller without putting a 70 ton airplane at risk. Now Curtis, our resident air traffic controller, could jump into this simulator and start controlling airplanes no problem. But it's much more entertaining to throw someone with no ATC experience in and see how they do. So, okay, so we're gonna have an aircraft coming in on our downwind over here. Okay. We can also see it on our screen, KLM 983, heavy. Okay. We're going to write our strip out, so we already have it wrote. Okay, so KLM 983, which is a heavy. Yep, that's what our H stands for. He's a Boeing 747-400 series. Okay, so got All it. All right, KLM has just called us up on our radio, so we're going to talk to him. Now, I'm used to being on the other side of the radio, so I'm familiar with the actual radio calls. KLM 983 Academy Tower, altimeter is 29087, ATIS is uniform. Winds are 249 or at 14, clear land, runway 28 right. But I'm used to being prompted by ATC to do things like turn off the runway or change radio frequencies. I'm not used to being the one doing the actual prompting. Once he lands, we're going to tell him to exit our runway. So now that he's touched down, KLM, and right here we have our strip, KLM 983. Okay. We're going to tell him to turn right, taxiway at Gulf. KLM 983, uh, exit Foxtrot or Golf right, and then over to ground on 125.7. All uh, right on Golf. And no sooner do I get one aircraft off the runway, I've got another coming in and one waiting to take off. So who's taking off right now? Southwest 326. And or sorry, come... correction, 324. Southwest 326 is oh, coming yeah. in. That's not All confusing. Right. <laughs> And with some of these call signs being similar, things can get confusing. Right now, I'm, I'm a little, we've got planes coming and going, and I'm, I'm definitely a step behind. I am absolutely a step behind. Luckily, this is all a simulation. I wouldn't say I was in control the whole time, but it appears that everything that landed and took off did so safely. Although there's probably some annoyed simulated pilots. ATC is just one of the multitude of non-flying careers you can train for at UND. As we've mentioned, if you're leaning toward becoming a pilot, there's a lot of fixed-wing paths you could go. But if you enjoy spinning in circles, you may also consider a career as a commercial helicopter pilot. Helicopter piloting, correct me if I'm wrong, you don't fly a helicopter as often for pleasure as you might flying a Cessna on the weekend. It's, it's really a, a working, if you're a helicopter pilot, that's probably your, your career. Definitely, uh, unless you're rich and you own your own helicopter and you can afford to take it out every day, then yeah, it's, it's a working machine. Uh, and that's kind of what we do here at UND is train career pilots. As part of their array of simulators, UND also has a helicopter simulator. And when the students are ready, a fleet of helicopters are waiting for real world experience. Now, regular viewers of our show will know that I've had some fun in commercial airline simulators in the past. So it seemed the perfect fit for me to give a helicopter a try. 
While they both fly through the air, helicopters and fixed-wing airplanes operate completely differently. So my experience as a private pilot really doesn't help a whole lot here. So we got three primary flight controls here. You're going to have your cyclic in the middle. You got your collective down here with your left hand. And you got your anti-torque pedals with your feet, not rudder pedals. OK, so I would know this as my yoke. Yeah. My, I don't know what, handbrake from my car. <laughs> uh, perhaps your uh, prop pitch or throttle, I guess, would be. So this would be my throttles and pitch, OK. and. These would be my rudder pedals, but so cyclic, collective, and torque. We'll call them the pedals, yeah. The pedals, okay. Now I know what the controls do, but actually using them is a different challenge. And we will need a left pedal a little bit as we increase collective, so we'll have the nose starts to yaw to the right, just increase the left pedal. Oh, this is freaky. Yep, a little bit of left pedal in there. We're sliding into the right. OK, now we're in a hover. Well, not really. <laughs> Holy macaroni. Eventually, after more spins, a close encounter with a pole and some trees, and taking out a taxiway light, I ended up back on the ground. That was really cool. It was really, really cool. That was that was really, really tricky. Uh, what? How'd I do? I mean, it was it was short. We were in the air for, I don't even know. How long are we in the air? Not very long, maybe a few minutes. But uh, I mean, you did really well for your first time. Most of our students uh, at UND, it'll take them maybe 10 hours to, to learn to hover, you know, to the point where they're confident enough to do it on their own. Uh, but you know, for the first time, if you can keep the helicopter upright and not slide around all over the place and control the direction, that's, that's a big step in the right direction. Wes says that flight went well, but I'd like to actually get more than five feet off the ground, so we take off again. Using the cyclic to increase our forward airspeed and bring in some collective to start increasing our altitude. Basically what we're going to do is the helicopter is going to move through effective translational lift, which is basically where we're moving out of our own downwash into clean air and we're gonna get a little bit of an aerodynamic boost. So you can feel the helicopter start to rise up simply by moving forward. You know what, this feels a little easier to me. Is that yep. me or? Yeah, this should be a little bit more intuitive. It's a little hard to get a sense of what level is though. For that, yeah, we'll use the tip path plane and the horizon. So right now we're just a tiny bit nose up. Right about here is level. Wow, because it feels nose down, so level feels nose down. Just a tiny bit nose down. As we turn to come back to the airport, out the window, things look similar to how it would in an airplane. But how I'm achieving this with the controls is definitely foreign. And while helicopters approach their landing site in a steeper way, I think I came in too fast and too hard. So you can feel the helicopter slowing down. Yeah, As you get slower and slower. Starting to get a little mushy here. Yeah, now we're getting back into the hover. You'll need more collective to prevent oh. us up on the collective. Oh. Did, I, did I dent the landing gear? Oh, yeah. OK, so brutally honest, how bad of a landing was that? <laughs> I think we might have spread the gear a little bit, but uh, any landing you can walk away from, right? Now, I won't be flying a helicopter or doing any air traffic control anytime soon. And if I were going to school, there would be a whole lot more training before I'd face real world scenarios. What we say up here is all you need is passion and we'll provide the rest. Most of our students will tell us that they had an idea that they were going to be involved in aviation in some form when they were very young. And the Odegaard School is one step in that process in terms of getting to where you, your goals are within the aerospace industry. One of the, the things that I think separates aviation from you know, other industries is the, the job variety. Uh, you know, it's, it's not going to be going into an office every day. It's not going to be, you know, doing the same, same task every day. Yes, we are flying the airplane every day, but each day is going to present a new problem or a new challenge. So it's, it's a good variety and it's, it's a, an office with a really good view. Elevator and rudder trim, take off, check. Avionics power switch on, check. Radio set, check. Parking brake release. The airplane flies beautifully. I love flying this airplane. This is the forefront of engine design technology. Shh, it's 
quiet and sleeping right now, but in seven or eight weeks, it'll be full of life. There's some additional risks and things that you need to know before you go flying at night, but with a little bit of training, flying at night is within any pilot's reach. I love working around airplanes. My dad was a private pilot, and I've grown up around airplanes, air shows all my life. Look to the left. Oh, boy. Ladies and gentlemen, on the left. My job at the air show is, one, to make the aerial performers look like they're the best thing that ever happened on the planet. Number two, to tie things together so that there is a flow to the show. One that's used least is to be that safety link in case something actually does go wrong. He called us later saying that if we hadn't been there, he thought he would have crashed. It truly is one of the most impressive pieces in aviation heritage that's flying today. So the more we can get people in aviation to, to fly and to love that passion for flight, as well as to support the men and women of our armed services. If I can help do that, that's a great accomplishment for my life. It was challenging, but it was really fulfilling uh, to be a part of this program, and it's something I'll, I'll always, always remember.